Uh, so, you know, I have the pleasure of uh, the first talk this morning, and uh, I'll be speaking about uh, surgical treatment of uh, spinal metastases. But uh, in the context of that, I think I have to mention a little bit about decision making as well um, to get the conversation going, uh, because that's oftentimes one of the more challenging parts for us, you know, who is the right surgical candidate and so on. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, you know, I think uh, over the last 10, 20 years, we made a tremendous amount of progress generating and analyzing data and uh, gaining better understanding of the uh, patients. So now I think we can uh, fairly comfortably say we have pretty clear indications and treatment recommendations that um, have been developed in consensus. Um, uh, the concept of SBRT, stereotactic body radiotherapy, has really changed how uh, we make these decisions um, and how we operate as well. And I'll speak a little bit about that, but there's some great talks coming up about the uh, role of radiation, so I won't spend too much time in the details there. And then we'll talk about some of the surgical techniques and how that's changed over the years. Um, and, you know, these are just some of the examples, and we'll return to them um, uh, toward the end of the talk in slightly greater detail. But we have been able to go from really, really massive big surgery that were required um, in order to provide tumor control to some outpatient procedures that are probably just uh, equally as effective. Um, and uh, that's because of SBRT, um, uh, because radiation gives us very effective local control, and also because our techniques have changed, and we can use much less invasive uh approaches um, and just smaller surgical footprint in general that allowed us to go from you know, the massive incisions to small ones and then um, you know being more targeted in terms of uh, instrumentation and really having more reliance on instrumentation and, and being able to hold up uh, for what we need to do. Uh, the goals of therapy, um, always important to talk about that, uh, neurologic function, and we get that from decompressing the spinal cord or preserving neurologic function, preventing uh, compression of the spinal cord, spinal stability, um, and with uh, those two things, we get pain control, and um, then, of course, it's important to make local tumor control durable enough uh, for the expected survival of the patient, so we always have to tailor the amount of surgery that we do with uh, the systemic therapy needs, radiation needs, and really how long we need um, our uh, surgery to last. Um, so uh, the NOMS paradigm um, is a very effective and uh, helpful way to make decisions. This was uh, developed by Dr. Bilski, and uh, you know, I think many of us use it, um, and uh, many have also modified it to their own uh, needs and tastes. But you know, I think it provides really great framework for uh, how to make these decisions and it consists of neurologic, oncologic, mechanical, and systemic considerations. And you know, I think the key to all this is really working together. And, you know, I think this course highlights that very nicely. You know, we have uh, people from uh, radiology, radiation oncology, and surgery uh, speaking today. And uh, that's because we all work together on a daily basis as well. And that's how we make better decisions for the patients. Uh, so we'll go through each one of these briefly um, uh, in terms of how to make decisions. So the first one is neurologic, and that's whether the patient actually has symptomatic spinal cord compression or myelopathy, uh, or radiculopathy, and what's the degree of um, uh, spinal cord compression. Um, and so, you know, I think the really important thing here is when somebody has true neurologic deficit from um, spinal cord compression by a tumor, you know, time is spine. We were used to saying that in the context of stroke, time is brain, but, you know, time is spine is, re is relevant here as well. So uh, if somebody lost ambulation, the sooner we can get them to surgery and decompressed, um, uh, the better their outcome is likely to be. Um, so uh, we give them steroids. Uh, they've been shown to have some neuroprotective effect in the setting. Uh, get them to surgery uh, and try to do it as uh, quickly as possible as long as it's safe. Of course, a lot of these patients are quite complex um, and surgery right away in the middle of the night is not always the safest thing for them. But if we can do it, if somebody can't walk and it's a cute onset, I think that's still probably something quite reasonable. Um, we uh, did a systematic literature review almost 10 years ago now, um, looking at outcomes of neurologic outcomes after surgery for metastatic tumors in patients who lost ambulation and had neurologic deficits. And the two key things were, of course, the duration of the ambulation loss and how profound the neurologic deficit is. Uh, so I think the message there is uh, treat and decompress as uh, quickly as possible in order to improve the chances of neurologic recovery and try to prevent progression of neurologic deficits. Um, and th that population is very hard to study, actually, as it turns out. You know, we have some data to say that, you know, patients improve after uh, decompressing from neurologic deficits. But when we looked at the IPOSA registry, you know, which is a fairly high quality registry, um, 
the first thing we saw, of course, is that you know patients who present for with more profound neurologic deficits, uh, so Asia A through C, really had uh, significantly worse survival compared to patients with less neuro, uh, severe neurologic deficits. And it is a small population and very hard to follow. So, you know, when we actually looked at how much follow-up we had for these patients at six weeks and 12 weeks, it was pretty abysmal. So, you know, while we can probably register that, yes, indeed, they improve early on after surgery like this, um, even with uh, bad neurologic deficits, oftentimes we don't really get to follow them because probably they continue to get sick and maybe um, their disability actually gets in the way of them uh, receiving effective uh, therapy to prolong survival. Um, but we're working on it and hopefully we'll make some progress and better understanding these patients, especially with modern technology and our ability to um, follow these patients remotely. Um, fortunately, most patients don't present with uh, severe neurologic deficits. You know, I think a lot of work has been done to get the concept um, uh, popularized that, you know, if somebody with cancer has back pain, uh, we should screen them with an MRI. So we're able to pick up uh, spinal tumors much earlier before they cause uh, catastrophic neurologic problems or fractures. And so oftentimes we're really uh, making decisions based on the radiographic assessment of uh, spinal cord compression or uh, epidural extension. And, and the main part here is, you know, bone only tumors and uh, tumors that just have minor epidural extension. Those are low grade epidural extension tumors. And then the ones that are uh, deforming and uh, severely compressing the spinal cord are high grade ones. And that'll matter when we're making decisions who actually need surgery. Um, the oncologic consideration looks at uh, tumor histology and how responsive the tumor is going to be to uh, systemic therapy, steroids, and radiation. And so, um, again, a systematic literature review was done. This was quite a few years ago, uh, looking at the responsiveness based on primary tumor histology to conventional radiation. And what we see is that there are certainly some tumors that are really radiosensitive, meaning you know, a lot of hem hematologic malignancies, um, as well as a few exceptions from the solid tumor malignancies, like breast and prostate, they're quite radiosensitive, so they respond well to conventional radiation in most settings. And then the other ones actually don't, and uh, that's where um, SBRT and radiosurgery comes in. So here's an example of multiple myeloma, um, pretty severe extensive epidural disease right here, and you see that after eight days of conventional radiation, the spinal cord is fully decompressed and the canal is cleared. On the other hand, this is a renal cell metastasis uh, that you know probably 20 years ago uh, would have required surgery because we are used to really relying on conventional radiation um, to provide truly durable tumor control in the setting of renal cell. But now we have a like, single fraction, a hyperfractionated radio surgery that can provide very effective tumor control. So even these types of tumors not, not, don't necessarily need excision just for local tumor control, as you can see here. Um, you know, this is follow-up a few months after radio surgery, and the tumor is uh, largely resolved. And so the data for uh, single fraction and hyperfraction are really compelling. You know, the 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 red uh, line right here is the risk of recurrence after high dose single fraction, and it's very very low. Even uh, several years out, um, it's uh, just about two percent risk of recurrence, which is quite amazing. So that means that we can really rely on SBRT for a lot of tumor control that we couldn't do before. And so where does surgery fall on this? You know, I was telling you that uh, conventional radiation is really good for tumors, um, even in the setting of some spinal cord compression, uh, as long as the tumor is sensitive to it. Um, we can also treat ra uh, radio insensitive tumors or radio resistant tumors with SRS, as long as this uh, conditions are right. But then there's that group where patients have spinal cord compression in the setting of solid tumor malignancies. And that's where we still have a role for decompressive surgery, of course. And then that doesn't always have to be just in the setting of um, severe neurologic deficit. So sort of one of the bedrock studies for um, uh, metastatic tumor surgery is the Patchell study that was published in 2005. And that was a study that randomized patients with solid tumor malignancies in the spine uh, that were symptomatic. And it could be symptomatic from instability. They could be symptomatic from uh, spinal cord compression. Um, but uh, the patients were randomized to either undergo surgery followed by radiation or radiation alone. And uh, the results in favor of surgery were quite dramatic. The study was actually uh, stopped at interim analysis. Uh, that's how big the difference was in terms of uh, in, in regaining ambulation, preserving ambulation, and there was even uh, slight survival benefit uh, for those patients. And, you know, I think what rings true is that you know when somebody is symptomatic from a solid tumor malignancy, most of the time it's either because they have mechanical instability or because they have some form of neurologic deficit. So neurologic deficit we just discussed, um, uh, those are the types of patients who uh, oftentimes really do benefit from surgery. And then um, uh, this leads us to mechanical instability. Uh, what does that mean? Um, you know, I think the simplest way of thinking of mechanical stability 
is ability to withstand physiologic loads. Um, in the context of spine tumors, uh, this is defined as loss of spinal integrity as a result of neoplastic process associated with movement-related pain, symptomatic or progressive deformity, or neural compromise under physiologic loads. Um, I would highlight the movement-related pain component as probably the key one. Um, and uh, you know, uh, when I uh, talk to the residents, fellows, you know, I oftentimes, uh, every time I want to know if uh, somebody got the patient out of bed, because I think that's one of the key uh, determinants there. Uh, it is really rare, I think, for us to see you know, significantly progressive uh, uh, deformity uh, or acute onset of uh, neural deficits uh, in the setting of spine tumors and instability, because the ligaments most of the time are still um, quite robust and they're able to hold the spine together. But it's really you know the pain that's the key determinant most of the time. And of course, we have a lot of ways to treat spinal instability, um, and it ranges from uh, percutaneous cement augmentation, whether it's kyphoplasty or tuberoplasty, to percutaneous instrumentation in combination with cement, and then uh, some of the open stabilization techniques. And we'll hear about the evolution of uh, implants and materials um, in uh, subsequent talks as well. And then finally, when we think somebody could use surgery, whether it's because of mechanical instability or decompression of the spinal cord, we really have to make sure that it's the appropriate patient and that the survival actually makes sense, as well as other systemic comorbidities. Um, a lot of work has been done and um, uh, better predicting survival, and um, you'll hear more about that in a separate talk. Um, and these are just some of the instruments, uh, the SORG, the New England uh, Survival Prediction Instrument. There are some machine learning um, uh, instruments as well that do a fairly good job of uh, giving a range. Um, uh, you know, I always struggle with how to really incorporate that. You know, of course, if uh, somebody's a true outlier and, you know, we're coming up with a uh, four-week survival um, or four-year survival, it's one thing. But everything in the middle kind of baffles me in terms of um, how to use that survival prediction. And, you know, we looked at um, the survival trends over 20 years um, in the uh, um, numerous non Kettering population. And a few things really stood out. Um, so one is that the 30 and 90 day mor uh, mortality hasn't really changed all that much for this patient population. It's still quite high. So, and, you know, this is true uh, 20 years ago and, you know, two years ago as well. Uh, so 30 day mortality was uh, just over 5%. Um, and then the 90 day mortality was um, nearly a quarter of the population. Um, so these are still quite challenging patients, and it's challenging to predict who's actually going to survive uh, long enough uh, uh, to benefit from this uh, in many situations. And maybe that's not always the key question, because there are some studies that actually show that even for patients with short-term survival, uh, surgery can have a very uh, meaningful, profound impact on the quality of life. Maybe that's all we really need. Um, Histology-wise, we still have bad players, um, and... Uh, and some good players, you know, of course, breast is uh, some of the better ones, uh, things like colon um, and even lung, you know, even though uh, we hear a lot of great uh, stories about the success of systemic therapy in select patients, but a lot of the lung cancer patients, by the time they're actually making it to surgery for spinal metastases are actually pretty advanced in their disease um, and don't have short survival. And overall, the survival benefit has really been very incremental. Um, uh, the growth uh, has been just about over 1% a year. So, you know, even though the, there's a nice slope to this curve, if you take it in the context of 20 years, um, it is still very gradual um, and, and slow. So putting it all together, um, uh, SBRT certainly makes a difference in how we make surgical decisions. And if you look at this patient with a solitary renal metastasis, um, you know, I think uh, the debate was much stronger about you know, 10, 20 years ago, whether this is somebody who needs surgery or radiation. Um, and uh, if we're really talking about uh, oncologic surgery for somebody with solitary renal cell metastasis, uh, this used to be an on-block resection, um, or at least uh, that was one of the uh, uh, seriously considered treatment options. That's a very, very big surgery, of course. Um, but now, uh, for somebody like this, knowing how effective SBRT is, we know that we can get good local tumor control with SBRT. Uh, we can uh, proactively treat it with uh, kyphoplasty because there's significant lytic destruction. And when we anticipate these complications, um, we can actually do this all as an outpatient and patients have uh, durable tumor control um, uh, for as long as we need most of the time uh, without needing uh, extensive surgery. The other part is uh, the integration of uh, SBRT into how we actually do the surgery itself and this concept of hybrid therapy for metastatic tumors, which is really a combination of uh, separation surgery and postoperative SBRT. 
So somebody like this is a patient with a T1 metastasis with high-grade spinal cord compression and some interscapular pain. She can undergo separation surgery, which is uh, uh, you know, certainly less extensive operation than uh, true cytologic reduction of this uh, tumor by, with front-back surgery, uh, followed by SBRT. Um, uh, we have a recommendation uh, based on the data that I presented uh, that patients with high-grade spinal cord compression from solid tumor malignancies undergo surgical decompression and stabilization followed by SBRT. With the surgery, if we're thinking about separation surgery, and again, it has to be uh, thought about in the context of post-operative SBRT as well. Um, but if you know that uh, radiation can give good local tumor control, you can um, assume that you don't necessarily need to do major site reduction. You just need to create the appropriate substrate and, and uh, setup for SBRT, which means that you do a full decompression of the spinal cord, make sure that there's a separation between the tumor and the spinal cord, leave most of the tumor volume uh, alone, stabilize the spine, and then also be part of the postoperative radiation planning because you have some insight into what the actual tumor look like, uh, where there might be concern for uh, tumor abutment, and so on. So the steps are uh, fairly straightforward, and I think most spine surgeons are quite comfortable uh, doing them. Um, so first, um, uh, posterior instrumentation, uh, then posterior decompression, uh, laminectomy, um, at least uh, half a level above and below where the actual tumor in the spinal cord compression is. Then you work around the spinal cord to remove the circumferential tumor, and the uh, dorsal lateral uh, uh, parts of, around the spinal cord, and then you have to get ventral, right? That's that's the key part to the separation. Most of these tumors are growing from the vertebral body and causing compression uh, from front to back. So you uh, localize uh, the posterior longitudinal ligament uh, separated from the, the fecal sac, and then you section it. And that's where the bulk of the compressive tumor is, and that's the key part of the separation. Um, if you don't do that, most of the time you end up with still um, too much tumor uh, budding and compressing the spinal cord. And even though the patient might be improved neurologically, the goal of optimizing the postoperative uh, radio surgery hasn't been accomplished. And it can really matter if the tumor is truly radio resistant, like renal cell. So you section the posterior longitudinal ligament to remove the ventral tumor to the spinal cord. Um, uh, intraoperative ultrasound is a really great adjunct to confirm that that's done. You know, here you see the tumor mass uh, displacing and compressing the spinal cord. Here you see that tumor mass gone and uh, CSF all around the spinal cord. Uh, and here's an axial view. So um, we have real-time confirmation of that. This is the postoperative construct, uh, some uh, scans, and uh, the patient undergoes post-op SBRT with uh, quite compelling data showing uh, good local tumor control over 90% um, and even higher if uh, we're able to deliver a higher per fraction doses. Uh, the other part is minimizing the surgical footprint, of course. Um, many of these uh, surgeries are done urgently and then patients need to go on to systemic therapy and, uh, and radiation. And so I think all of us are used to dealing with uh, these types of wounds and you know, getting our plastic surgery colleagues involved uh, in helping us fix these. And oftentimes these are really big, uh, massive reconstructions that really delay the systemic therapy and to a tumor treatment that needs to happen um, after the surgery. So if we can use smaller incisions um, uh, and uh, incorporate the MIS techniques um, more commonly used um, in the degenerative world, I think we can um, uh, do quite a bit of service for our patients. Uh, and, and same thing with actual hardware itself. Um, you know, if we have better hardware, we, uh, we can use uh, cement augmented screws. Um, oftentimes we can avoid really extensive constructs, even in the setting of uh, diffuse metastatic disease in the spine. Um, this is a patient who was actually in the midst of radiation um, and uh, suffered progression of a fracture that required uh, uh, surgical stabilization and decompression. And so, you know, somebody uh, with a tumor in the lumbar spine in the midst of conventional radiation, um, even with plastic surgery, we would be really concerned about uh, postoperative wound dehiscence and, and problems from that. But um, if we're able to do percutaneous instrumentation and then minimally invasive decompression, the incisions are quite small. Most, most of the time we can get away with it. And this is exactly what was done here, uh, percutaneous instrumentation uh, with cement augmentation, which allows us to go short on the constructs, um, uh, cement augmentation of the tumor level as well in order to provide better anterior column support, um, and then uh, navigated minimally invasive decompression. Um, you, know, you can use it to uh, place screws, and you can certainly use it to uh, place the retractors in the optimal uh, setting uh, location in order to do the decompression. Um, uh, this is an algorithm that we published uh, for uh, 
integrating uh, minimally invasive techniques into um, decision making. And uh, I think for pretty much most of our uh, metastatic tumor indications, uh, there's a range of minimally invasive techniques that go from kyphoplasty or tuberoplasty to mini open and uh, percutaneous. Looking at quality of life after surgery for metastatic tumors, um, I think we are certainly making a meaningful impact. I think we all know it uh, based on seeing our patients and the data certainly support it. Um, uh, this is uh, true after that uh, concept of hybrid uh, therapy with separation surgery um, and uh, postoperative SBRT, as well as there are a lot of data for uh, other types of surgery as well. Um, when looking at SINs, um, and you know, probably this is intuitive, patients with higher SIN scores tend to be a lot more symptomatic, and so they uh, experience pretty significant uh, improvement in quality of life in terms of pain control and activity. Um, so when we stabilize unstable spines, we're clearly making a significant difference um, in the quality of life functionality. Uh, a slightly different way of looking at this, you know, oftentimes patients want to know how much uh, their pain is going to get better. And, um, you know, I think rather than just being binary that, yes, we know it'll improve. Um, or um, uh, we, we looked at uh, some of the pain changes uh, just based on percentages uh, and how uh, what proportion of patients, you know, reach a certain percentage of pain relief. It's kind of being uh, an interesting and in some ways humbling journey um, to, to look at that. So, you know, now you can say that, you know, 50% of our patients experience 30% pain relief. Um, you know, just another way of uh, helping patients understand that, you know, some want more numbers, some don't. Um, and and uh, again, intuitively, it's interesting. Um, who actually has truly great outcomes and not just, you know, in terms of proportion of pain relief, but like who is largely symptom-free. And, you know, we called symptom-free uh, pain scores uh, from um, zero to four. And uh, again, probably quite intuitive, but uh, your patients who are significantly more symptomatic, although they experience, uh, they still experience meaningful pain relief, oftentimes they don't actually reach that asymptomatic uh, uh, result after the surgery. And I think this, along with uh, what we were talking about earlier in terms of anticipating and preventing neurologic deficits, it's also important to anticipate and prevent uh, severe symptoms. Um, so it's really nice to get to these patients earlier before they develop severe pain um, because oftentimes they don't actually fully uh, recover to pain-free survival after the surgery, even though everything else looks great. Um, and same thing with neurologic deficits and postoperative complications. These were um, things that um, were adverse predictors of uh, pain-free uh, results after the surgery. Uh, so um, hopefully this was a helpful um, overview uh, of indications. Um, uh, GNOMES is certainly a great way to uh, make decisions about who needs surgery. Um, uh, radiation has really evolved and changed and uh, changed not only uh, the radiation result, but how we can do surgery. And then uh, minimizing the footprint of the surgery can have uh, significant impact uh, as well in terms of uh, patient recovery. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to take some questions. That's my microphone. Yeah. Dr. Laufer, is Jens Chapman. Sorry, I came a little bit late. I'm on call here. And uh, this is, as always, a spectacular lecture. And congratulations on your tremendous work. So these are some of the classic questions. So one of the key things that we need to always take into account is we need to, in uh, regular circumstances, just as what we're doing right now downstairs, make up our mind and be very decisive early on. We don't have the luxury of waiting for biopsies, et cetera. We need to try to make some predictions as to survivability of patients. Any nutshell ideas of how to, or what key parameters to look at? Should we look at more scores? Uh, should we get a Karnofsky index or a frailty index or something like that to try to help us predict uh, survivability? Just guide us a little bit in terms of if we have to go relatively rapidly within 24 hours, what parameters to look for? Uh, yeah, great question. Very vexing. You know, I actually recently gave a different talk about the fact that we probably don't really know enough to uh, make database uh, decisions um, in, the, in these situations, unfortunately. Um, so uh, I guess a few things. I think frailty is really interesting. I think that um, we're definitely exploring and there, there are emerging data to say that frailty can really help us make decisions in terms of preoperative risk uh, for, the, for uh, metastatic patients. I think that uh, the survival prediction um, stuff is is important. You know, I think it's nice to know, you know, when we look at a patient, you know, who's going to live for a while and who who won't. I don't know if that's really the key driver of uh, acute surgical decision. Um, you know, I think uh, 
every, everything is a range. And most of the time, you know, these survival prediction models give us a range. You know, somebody's going to live between, you know, three months and three years. Well, that's that's great um, and with, you know, 80% pr probability. I don't really know what to do with that. You know, I think if uh, the survival model tells you that the patient has 80% probability of dying within a month, I think that's useful. Uh, and everything else is outside of that. Uh, so I think the idea there is, you know, if somebody's so sick uh, and has such advanced cancer that there are no other therapies to be done and, you know, they're coming into the surgery so severely debilitated at high risk for postoperative complication, perhaps that's the patient where we say, you know what, we're not going to be able to help you in a meaningful way. I think just about everybody else, we can. And I, I, I alluded to a study that was done uh, by Nick Day, you know, where they actually looked at patients with short postoperative survival. And, you know, I think the important message there was that their quality of life uh, improved significantly and importantly for the duration of their life. So I think if we have that opportunity, surgeons, uh, I think that's a nice thing to do. Uh, and uh, I don't really have a problem doing that. Um, I, I also think that if we can avoid postoperative complications, then I think that's a really important one as well. You know, again, if somebody is incredibly frail and it's super high risk for postoperative uh, wound infection, and we're worried about, you know, not being able to get that patient out of uh, the hospital, um, and we know that postoperatively they're going to spend three months recovering from all this, um, uh, you know, that's probably the type of patient to avoid. But I think everybody else, you know, uh, neurology trumps a lot of the decisions for me. So if somebody is acutely neurologically uh, disabled and we think we can improve their quality of life, I think... We, that's where we as surgeons can uh, do our very best for them and then hope for the best. And I think that's fair. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, uh, and again, the, the key thing for me is that what I'm learning and what I'm seeing is a paradigm shift from this arbitrary three-month survival expectation, which is a wild guess usually, um, towards actually doing less invasive surgeries but meaningful decompression stabilizations and getting people up and returning them to life at home as much as possible. And that's, I think, from what I gathered from your statement. I have a technical question, if I may, um, and that goes into the next lab. And the question is um, <clears throat> uh, cementing. So you showed some very nice cement cases. Uh, the bone substance of patients is usually terrible. Uh, they're metabolically challenged. They go through a very acute osteoporosis, actually, even if they do not have underlying osteoporosis. When you cement, what is better? Are these newer fenestrated screws? And we're going to go into the lab and see that in a second truly better than if you just cannulate and put a 2cc cement blob in there? What are your thoughts on what's actually really better fixation? Um, and so in my humble opinion, I think um, fenestrated screws is a safer fixation because, um, you know, I actually got to catch the, I guess, tail end of the time when we didn't have fenestrated screws. And I remember when uh, they became uh, FDA approved in the U.S., we were very excited about it. So before they were approved, we used to do that, exactly that, cannulate, put in cement and then put in a screw. I think the problem is that, you know, if you put in a reasonable amount of cement into that screw cannulation and put a big screw in there, you have absolutely no control about what happens to the cement um, and it can extravasate in an uncontrolled way and go into a vein. So you don't really have the benefit of stopping uh, the cement injection. And even in those uh, scenarios, most of the time we get away with it uh, and uh, nothing catastrophic happens. But I do think that the fenestrator screws allow you to do this in a much more controlled way. So you inject a little bit, you take an x-ray, make sure there's no significant extravasation and uh, you keep going. I moved from trying to maximize the amount of cement injection. Um, I used to try to do that and try to fill the vertebral body and like see a really big cloud of cement around it actually being uh, pretty conservative with that. You know, I think uh, I usually stop at 1cc, sometimes even early if I have a little bit of control. And I've never actually regretted not putting in more cement. The only the only ones I've regretted is putting in too much cement and then watching it go into the IVC and, you know, embolize and postoperative chest CTs. I'll shut up now, Dr. Mendel, Dr. Skouin. Yeah, I agree, Ilya. I think less is more when it comes to the cement injection through the screws. I think we should stop thinking about the cement injection through screws as a vertebroplasty. It's not. It's about just making sure that the screw doesn't pull out. So in that sense, all you need is some cement around the tip of the screw to make sure it anchors well. But the idea of just filling up the whole vertebra, I'm not sure it's something you really need to worry about. And typically, the vertebras that you put the screws in are non-broken vertebras, typically. So. So it's really just about the pullout strengths and increase the pullout strengths of these screws. I have a That's question cool. for you when it comes to your thoughts about prophylactic 
cement injection into a fracture that needs radio surgery. So you get somebody with a T9 fracture related to, I don't know, whatever method it is, with a good candidacy for radio surgery. The patient has maybe mild mechanical back pain. Do you prophylactically do the tiboplasties on this patient prior to radio surgery, considering potential progression of the fracture after radio surgery? Yeah, um, uh, always up for debate. Uh, and, you know, I wish we would finally uh, do something to study it in a more systematic way. And I think there, uh, there's some work ha that has been done. And uh, I, I have a very low threshold for that. So uh, the, pr the patient that you described, even with a little bit of back pain uh, associated with it, I think uh, it's easy enough to do a preoperative, uh, pre-SBRT, excuse me, uh, retiroplasty or kyphoplasty to prevent further uh, fracture progression. Um, you know, I think somebody with, you know, 80% lytic destruction of the vertebral body going for SBRT. I think that's another one that's probably a good candidate because, you know, if they're fractured, it'll be a major fracture. I think that oftentimes, you know, we tend to under treat the resulting deformity from those fractures and, you know, patients still have some symptoms from that, even though they may not be acute, but, you know, oftentimes, um, if there's an L1 burst fracture uh, and uh, they're pitched forward, um, they'll still have some chronic back pain, even though the tumor is not recurring, even though they're not grossly mechanically unstable. So I think if we can prevent some of those, um, uh, I think uh, pre SBRT kyphoplasty is a nice treatment option. And you would do a, a non fractured vertebrae that has significant lady component. You would advocate prophylactic cement on these? I would. Think about it. And, you know, funny enough, uh, it's oftentimes the radi radiation oncologist who will ask about it first because, yeah. you know, to them, uh, post-radiation uh, fracture is uh, one of the severe complications that they have to report and, you know, they really hate seeing them. You know, I think we're all a lot more comfortable with it and, you know, I don't really have uh, super strong feelings about it because most of the time we can still, even after the SBRT, treat it with uh, uh, kyphoplasty pretty effectively. But, you know, I think if somebody is at super high risk, you know, uh, for fracture progression, again, you know, like, let's say like thoracolumbar junction, significant lytic destruction, and uh, going for SBRT, I think most of the time the penalty for uh, putting cement in that uh, fracture is quite low, excuse me, into that tumor in that fracture is quite low. Um, and I think that the consequence of not doing that and, you know, somebody having that fracture and uh, kyphotic deformity form uh, develop, I think that's higher. So, you know, I think if there's a team that's willing to do that, I think uh, I think it's a reasonable argument. Great, thank you. Should we go into the lab, uh, Huri, yeah. Dr. Bilski, yeah. and just do in vivo what we just talked about in cement? Amir, are you live? 